Well, hello and welcome again to uh, our midweek Bible study time. And this is our resurrection lesson. You know, we've been studying about uh, uh, the Queens of Resistance and, and Black History before that, Martin Luther King before that. Well, but today's lesson is what it's all about. Resurrection Sunday. While I was working on this, I love to listen to music while I'm trying to study. And a song came on. It was entitled, The Blood Still Works. And I looked at the thing and I thought the blood still works. And I thought to myself, well, who said it didn't work? And then they went on to say it will never lose its power. I, I thoroughly got confused. The blood still works. And yes, let me just say right here, right now, the blood works. Forget the still, it works. And in our lesson today, we will see the importance of the blood. Now you got to remember that at the death of Jesus, a new uh, ordinance, a new testament, a new covenant was being introduced. And anytime you had something new like a covenant, then you had to have it verified. You had to uh, set aside a time to uh, make sure that everything is done. A sacrifice has to be made, if you please. And this is what the death of Jesus means to you and to me. It ushered us in to being one of God's children and not have to be a Jew. Woo! They're shouting right there. They're shouting territory right there. So, in fact, when coming up in church, uh, we used to sing, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood that saved me. Then we were saying something like it was down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where from cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. And then there was another one that said, it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. And we in the church, we've gotten so caught up on Well, I, I would say worship, but I'm not sure that we know when we worship, we worship God just because he's God. And I'm not sure how many of us know who God is. We praise him because of what he's done. And I'm not sure that some of us take into account what he has done. Well, our lesson today, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there? Well, if not, we have this lesson in front of us to help us take another look, not just a look, another look at the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus that we might be transformed and do what the women in the lesson is going to do, run and tell. All right, let's get started. So Pilate, I'm reading for Luke 23, uh, verse 24 through 26. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. That's the Sanhedrin court and the people and the liars. 
and he released to them the one they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison. So he gave them Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison. But, ah, he delivered Jesus to their will. Now, as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Now, the first thing that we need to see in this lesson, let's look at Simon. From a human perspective, oh, we might say Simon was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Simon apparently was a pilgrim coming to celebrate the Passover. See, but nothing happens by chance. Simon was being pressed into carrying the cross for Jesus was in God's plan anyway. And it's a reminder to us. See, this first section that we're looking at is called reminder. It's a reminder to us that we must carry the cross of Jesus if we desire to be known as one of his believers or to show conversion. Uh, Luke 29, I mean Luke 9 and 23 says, Then he said to them, all of them, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, let's look at the point to ponder. You know, we, must, we sing a song in church, uh, Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. What cross are you willing to bear? Are, are you bearing a cross for Jesus? Only you can answer that. Are you bearing a cross for Jesus? In fact, are you willing to bear a cross for him? All right, let's look at Luke 23, 27. And a great multitude of the people followed him. <laughs> and women who also mourned and lamented him. I love the way they said a great crowd of people follow and women, just like the women wasn't people, but uh, that's neither here nor there. But that's the way they did it because women would, had no value to them, to man, but he has value to God and to Jesus. Now, so let's look at the response. There was a great crowd of mourners, uh, a picture of hearts that felt for Jesus. They ached for Jesus, especially the women. Now, let me say the word bewail, which is used in King James Version, means to cut, to smite, to strike, to beat. So they were cut to the core of their hearts actually feeling pain for Jesus. I got news for you. I can sit down, as I'm going to do this week, and look at Jesus of Nazareth, look at the passion of the Christ, and it will hurt me to my heart to see what they did to Jesus. And this is what the women felt. The word lamented means to cry out loud, 
to groan, to moan. And they were crying out, unable to hold back the pain, cutting their hearts. But let me say this. Some people, of course, had been followers of Jesus for a long time and were feeling the depth of his suffering. But there are some onlookers in any crowd. Let there be an accident going home or going somewhere else and you see an accident. You see a crowd of people. There will be some people that will say, oh, Lord. I mean, I looked at the bridge that collapsed in Baltimore. Was it? Yeah, Baltimore. And it hurt me. I thought, oh. And, and, and you know what I did? I said, Lord, please help whoever was on that bridge. Help them because they need help. This is beyond their control. They don't know nothing. They was riding and driving, and all of a sudden, the bridge gives way. So you can always have a crowd of people, some who hurt with the ones who are hurting, and then you have the others who have a natural tendency and a tenderness, and they lament over someone else's suffering. Well, let me take it to the heart of the lesson. Repentance. A feeling sorry and having a natural tenderness to the Lord's suffering is not enough. I want you to listen to me here because we get ready to get into some good stuff now. A natural response, let me say it again, is not enough to, to claim repentance just because you see the Lord suffering. A person must repent. And repentance is a critical, critical element of conversion. But please, please, please do not simply dismiss it as another word for believing. I mean, Satan believed. He knew Jesus. He believed Jesus was the Son of God. But he never repents. So, Repentance has to be more than just believing. Repentance literally means afterthought or change of mind. Oh, talk to me. But biblically, it meaning does not stop there. It, it, it just because you you say, okay, yeah, I just have a forethought, or afterthought, I changed my mind. But it doesn't stop there. In the New Testament, repentance always, always, always speak of a change of purpose. And specifically, watch this, watch this. You got to remember this, a turning from sin. See, in the sense that Jesus used it, repentance called a rejection of the old life and a turning to God for salvation. Now, let me just say this. When you turn from something, see, if I'm looking this way and I turn this way, I'm turning from something to something. But if I don't turn to something, then I'll turn back to my old way. Woo! Do you hear me? I'm trying to teach this thing to you now. So it's a turning, but you just can't turn 
you got to turn from to. So in other words, Jesus was saying a rejection of the old life and a turning to God for salvation. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1 and 9. The people themselves tell us, this is Paul speaking, the people themselves tell us how you received us when we came to you. They talked of how you turn to God. Woo! From worshiping false God. So on this hand, they were worshiping false God, but then they turned from the false God to worship the true and living God. That's what Paul said in first Thessalonians. Let's repent it. Repentance is not merely shame or sorrow for sin. It is not just that. Although genuine repentance may involve an element of remorse, it is a redirecting of the human will, a purposeful decision I have made up in my mind. I have made a decision to forsake all unrighteousness and pursue righteousness instead. Repentance is not merely human work. It is every element of redemption, a sovereignly God bestowed gift of God. Repentance is a gift from God. And repentance is not merely a mental activity. Genuine, genuine repentance involves the intellect, the emotions, and the will. Now what I mean, intellectually, repentance begins with a recognition of sin, the understanding that we are sinners. Oh, I know we don't want to call ourselves sinners. We think we got it all together. But we need to recognize and understand we are sinners and that our sin is an affront to God. And more precisely, we are personally responsible. Oh, I know we love to blame it on how we were raised and what happened in our neighborhood, but we are personally responsible for our own guilt. Intellectually, you got to understand that. Emotionally, genuine repentance often accompanies an overwhelming, overwhelming, overwhelming sense of sorrow. See, that, that, that's, that's the way it is. Overwhelming sense of sorrow. See, we just cannot feel bad. Well, you know, I just, I just don't know. I feel so sorry. No, 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 no. Look at Matthew 27 and 3. Look at Matthew 27 and 3. Then Judas was sorry. He had handed Jesus over when he saw that Jesus was going to be killed. He was sorry. He took back the 30 pieces of silver and gave it to the head religious leaders and the other leaders. He was sorry. But guess what? As too bad, he did not so sorry. That's all he did. And then he went out and hung himself. He felt sorry for who? For himself or for Jesus? He didn't realize he'd been duped. I often said, Lord, if Judas could have just waited until Christ rose from the dead, what a testimony he would have. But Peter did. 
Peter, he betrayed him. Uh, he denied him. That, that's it. Judas betrayed him. He denied him, but he, he even approached the Lord and said he was sorry. Sorry for over his sins. And he was forgiven. Now, Matthew 19.22. <clears throat> you remember, excuse me, just one minute. There was a rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, Good master, Jesus said, Why are you calling me good? Yeah, good master, what must I do? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And when Jesus told him what he must do, Sell all that you have, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me, and give the what you got, give it to the poor. When the young man heard these words, he went away sad, not saved, but sad. Because he felt sorrowful. Oh man, that's why he he was sad. And again, I say he was sad, but he was not saved, for he had many riches. Then let's look at 2 Corinthians 7 and 10. The sorrow that God uses makes people sorry for their sin and leads them to, there's that word, turn from sin. So they can be saved from the punishment of sin. We should be happy for that kind of sorrow. But the sorrow of this world brings death. All right. So now that's what we call when we say emotionally. Not about, oh, I feel so bad about that. Ah. Now let's look at the will. The will shows a, a repentance involves a change of direction, a transformation, a change of the will. It's much more than changing only your mind. It constitutes a willingness, more accurately, a determination to abandon stubborn disobedience and surrender the will to Christ. So as such, genuine repentance will inevitably result in a change woo, of behavior. That's why the old folks used to say, things I used to do, I don't do no more. Because there has been a change. I think it was what Tremaine Hawkins, what Walter Hawkins used to say, a change has come over me. Now, 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 please understand this. Let me say this. The behavior change is not in and of itself. Repentance. Whoops. Behavior change is not in and of itself repentance. What is it? It's the fruit repentance will bear. You see, we got to bear some fruit. See, now look, see, look at Ezekiel 33, 18, 19, when the Right and good man turns. There's that word again. It's all about turning. Uh, uh, what's that song? Um, only a look. Turn ye away from sin. One look. But you can't look unless you turn. I, look here. Look here. Uh, uh, third chapter, Exodus. When Moses saw the burning bush, he said, let me... Turn aside and see what's going on here. 
John, in Revelation, he owned the Isle of Patmos. He heard a voice. The Bible said he turned. If you don't turn, you will not see what you need to see. So, when the right and good man turns from his good ways and sins, he will die for it. Woo! But, ah, always a but. But when the sinful man turns from his sin and does what is right and good, he will live because of it. Because of what? Because he turned. But now let me hasten to say this. If a right and good man turns back to God, there's the turning again, he will be saved. Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people who are called by my name put away their pride and pray. Well, is that all it takes to you? No. And look for my face. Is that all it takes? No. And turn from their sinful ways. Then, you see, go back. 14th verse starts, if, then. See, our problem is we want the then before the if. But God said, if you do your part, I'll do my part. But see, we want God to do his part. And then we're going to think about whether we're going to do our part. No, no, no. He said, if my people who are called by my name, Put away they pride and pray and look for my face and turn from their sinful ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's a conditional promise. You do your part, I'll do my part. Then Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Seek the Lord. Why he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Whoops, here it comes again. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God for he will freely pardon. Then let's go to Jonah 3.10. When God saw what they did and how they, ooh, there's a word again. I can't, I hope you remember. There's got to be some turning away from the old way and how they turned from their evil ways. He relented. But he didn't do it until he saw that they had turned from their old ways and did not bring the destruction on them. He had threatened. Whoa. <sighs> you got it? All right. Now let's go down to Luke 23, 28 through 33. But Jesus turning, <laughs> there it is again, turning to them said, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, wound that never bored, and breast that which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? There were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to a place called Calvary, make no mistake, Calvary is nothing but a garbage dump. There they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand, and the other on the left. 
that I, I, uh, I uh, want to say to you, if you did not hear Dr. Cosby preach about these two thieves on the cross with Jesus, then I suggest you go back, pull up the sermon for Palm Sunday, and it was called The Prayer That You Should Pray. I think it was it, the prayer you should pray and listen to it. It'll bless you. But now let's get to the rejection. Jesus declares the prediction of Jerusalem's doom, a picture of coming judgment. The people had rejected God's Messiah. They had rejected salvation choosing to go the way of the world. And the way of the world was doom and destruction. <sighs> the destruction coming would be so terrible. People would weep for themselves. People would wish to be childless. People would wish to be buried alive. Now, let me tell you, when uh, I first read that long time ago about the day will come when a woman would, would say, I'm blessed because I never had a child and all that, I, I didn't understand it. Because, see, I was just like any other woman. I wanted a good husband. I didn't want just a husband. I wanted a good husband. And I wanted a family. I wanted children. And I prayed to the Lord to give them to me. But he didn't. I wouldn't or something. And I kept praying for it. And I read that, I said, I don't understand how it is that women at one time will say, I never understood it until now, until the time we are living in now, where I could say, who I'm sure glad I don't have no kids. I don't have to worry about, ow, oh, I got children, I didn't birth them. But I got more children than the woman in the old woman in the shoe. Had so many children, she didn't know what to do. So, but then let me say, verse 31 is a proverbial saying. If the world, Rome, treats a green tree like this, him, Christ a tree with its full provision of sap, how will it treat a dry tree like Israel, like you, like me? A tree with litter, if any provision of sap, a tree of no use with no life red, left, ready to be cut down and destroyed. What's going to happen to it? Well, you know, uh, let's look at, uh, yeah, I will take the time to do it. Then Jesus told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it, found none. So he said to the worker who tended, who, uh, tended the vineyard, for three years now I have come looking for fruit on this tree, and each time I inspect it, I find none. Cut it down. Why should it deplete the soil? But the worst worker answered, sir, leave it alone this year too until I dig around it and put fertilizer on it. Then if it bears fruit next year, very well. But if not, you can cut it down. Now, let me say this. Jesus is coming looking from fruit for fruit from us. And if he can't find the fruit, oh, some of you can't beat us coming to church. singing in the choir, doing whatever we got to do. 
but he's looking for a fruit. Now let's look at Matthew 21, 18, 19. Now early in the morning as he returned to the city, he was hungry. After noticing a fig tree by the road, he went to it, but found nothing on it, oops, except leaves. He said to it, never again will there be fruit from you. And the fig tree wilted at once. Now here again, let me just say this. Why cut the tree down, Jesus? Why curse the tree? Why well, say, look here, because the tree wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. It looked like a fig tree, had leaves like a fig tree, but it had no figs. And if you're going to have leaves, when the leaves come out, it was time for the figs to come out. But Jesus found nothing. He said, well, then guess what? You're not going to bring forth anything at all. And the tree wilted. Let me just tell you, we got folks that come to church, they look like Christians. They act like Christians. You cannot, they got, uh, they can speak Christianese way better than I can. But what good is that if you never come to Bible study, if you never come to Sunday school, if you never pick up your Bible and read it during the week? Won't the pastor preach you happy and, and then you forget what he said before you get outside to the parking lot? And if you get outside to the parking lot and things ain't like what you want, then you really you ready to act up. He is looking for fruit. So they came to Calvary. They crucified him. The crucifixion of Jesus is both the most shocking event and the most wonderful event in human history. Now you wonder how can it be both? It's the most shocking event in that it is the creature murdering the creator. Woo! It's the most wonderful event in that it is the creator saving the creature. Now, you got it? Let's go. On the first day, Luke chapter 24, verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Mark 16, 2, verses 2 and 3 said they had a discussion. Who going to roll the stone away? I love that part because they, but they never stopped walking. They kept right on walking. Well, who going to, I don't know. Well, I don't, we don't have the strength to move it. No, we don't. So who going to move it? I don't know, but they kept walking. And we cannot let anything stop us. The first day of the week was Sunday. That's the day that Jesus arose. And, clear, and Luke clearly spells out when Jesus arose. Upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning. See, so Jesus arose before dawn, before the sun came up. The S-U-N came up, the S-O-N came up. And it was so significant to the early believers that they, they start worshiping on Sundays, first day of the week, instead of the Sabbath. Now, then, so when Jesus rose on the first day of the week on Sunday morning, this means, now listen to me now, he had been dead and in the grave for three days just as he had said he would be. He was in the grave on the Sabbath, unable to observe the laws governing the great season of the Passover and the Sabbath. 
He was dead, dead, dead. Therefore, the law and its observance had no authority over him. And this is very symbolic of the identification believers gain in Christ. When a man believes in Christ Jesus, God identifies the man with Christ, in particular with the death of Christ. God counts the man as having died with Christ. Very simply, in Christ's death, believers become dead to the law. Now, being dead to the law does not mean that we uh, uh, thumb our nose up at the law. And I just want to say that I salute St. Stephen because this Sunday will be Baptism Sunday. And because Christ got up from the grave, we have nine candidates that will be buried in a watery grave and then resurrected into the newness of life. Woo! Hallelujah! Now, and just let me say, and one of them is my, one of my little godchildren. That boy can't wait to get baptized. And I can't wait for him to get baptized. Luke 24, 2 through 10. My time is up. They found the stone rolled away, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning uh, stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Hey, 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 why do you look for the living among the dead? Ah! What a question. Stop looking for the living among the dead. He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you he was still with you when he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Check out verse 8. Then they remember his words. Ah, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. Who? The women. See, and you got to get this. The women were the first witnesses of the resurrection and they provide a strong evidence of the resurrection. I mean, these women, they knew he was dead. And they knew where he had been laid. Why? Because they were there on Friday. They had followed along behind the procession to the tomb. There was no question whatsoever in their mind that Jesus was dead. So why are they coming? Because they love the Lord and they were there. They said, oh, no, you know, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, he, he anointed the body of Jesus. He didn't do it. No, no, we can't let our Lord and Savior be hand, body be handled like that. So guess what? They got up early to come and, and uh, 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 they wanted to anoint the body of Jesus properly. But they ran into two angels, and these angels rebuked the women. Why? Because they said, you focusing on a dead Savior, a dead Savior. Now, a dead Savior can't save. And it was evident to the women that Jesus was not in the tomb. So, he is risen, that's what the angel said, a startling, unbelievable words. Yet heaven witnessed that he lives. 
uh, uh, Hebrews 7, 8. Furthermore, here in the Levitical priesthood, tithes are received by men who are subject to death. But in that case concerning Melchizedek, they are received by one of whom it is testified that he lives on perpetually. So heaven said he lives. Scripture witnesses that he arose. Romans 1 and 4, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. Then Ephesians 1, 19 through 20, I pray that you will know how great his power is for those who have put their trust in him. It is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. The same power put Christ at God's right side in heaven. And it was foretold that he would arise. And Luke 9.22, he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things. Jesus told this. And the religious leaders and the teachers of the law will have nothing to do with him. He must be killed and raised from the dead three days later. Luke 17, 25, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Luke 18, 31 through 34, then he took the 12 aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished, for he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spread on. They will scourge him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. But they understood none of these things. This thing, this saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. But the twelve understood none of these things. This is Luke 18, 34. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what Jesus meant. Uh-uh. Matthew 28, 6 through 8. He is not here. But he has been raised just as he said. Come and see the place where he was laying, lying. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. Angels talking to the women. And this is what Matthew said. He has been raised from the dead. He is going ahead of you into Jerusalem. You will see him there. Listen, I have told you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And the same thing I say to you, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. And if you don't know him, get to know him. Come and go with us. We own our way up the King's Highway. You want to join us? You can email us at newstart at ssclive.org. Or you can call us at 502-583-6798 and let them know I want to uh, uh, give my life to Christ. I also invite you to come out uh, Friday, Good Friday, 
at 11 a.m. when we will have the last seven words from the cross. It will be an hour of power. So from 11 to noon, I know you can give God that kind of time. Then uh, starting in April, our series will be the Lord's Prayer. It's not what you think. It's not what you think. We will be studying from John chapter 17. And the lesson will be called Prayer, Basic Training. You have a blessed Resurrection Sunday, and I'll see you next week. Be blessed.